Thank you. The next item of business is a statement by John Swinney on the Smith Commission. The Deputy First Minister will take questions at the end of his statement and there should therefore be no interventions or interruptions. I call on the Deputy First Minister. Around 15 minutes, Deputy First Minister. President, officer, the Scottish Government believes that decisions affecting the lives of people in Scotland should be taken here in Scotland to reflect the priorities and views of those who choose to live and to work in this country. That is why we campaigned for the establishment of the Scottish Parliament, why we voted for the Scotland Act in 1998 and why we supported the Scotland Act in 2012. It is why we campaigned for and believe in Scottish independence and it is also why we took part in the process of the Smith Commission. In the light of the referendum result, the Government produced proposals for further devolution on the 10th of October, arguing for a robust package of powers of further powers for this Parliament. As a participant in the proceedings and on behalf of the Scottish Government, I want to record our thanks to Lord Smith of Kelvin for his clear, focused and neutral direction of the Commission's proceedings. I am also grateful to the Secretariat of the Commission, made up of officials from the United Kingdom and the Scottish Governments, and also of this Parliament, for their hard work in supporting the process. I also thank other members of the Commission for the generally good-natured approach taken to the process. The Commission had a challenging task. The promises made to the people of Scotland in the lead-up to the referendum of home rule and near federalism and extensive powers for this Parliament meant that expectations around this process were extremely high. 407 organisations and over 18,000 individuals in Scotland took the time to write to the Smith Commission, setting out their views on further devolution. This clearly demonstrates that engagement and interest in politics in Scotland remains as strong as during the referendum. On behalf of the Scottish Government, I welcome the contents of the report, but I regret that a wider range of powers have not been <laughs> devolved. The report contains a number of recommendations that will enable this Parliament to better serve the people of Scotland. Devolution of air passenger duty, in particular, is a responsibility for which we have been calling for some time and was first, alongside the devolution of the aggregates levy, proposed by the Kalman Commission in 2009. It is a tax which impacts on our tourism industry and the wider business sector. More extensive powers over income tax, albeit within the reserve framework set by Westminster, opens up new opportunities to this Parliament and will increase accountability. The flexibility over all rates and bans, except the personal allowance, is an improvement on the narrow and inflexible power for a Scottish rate of income tax that we are in the process of implementing. The devolution of some benefits for disabled people, carers and our elderly will enable us to develop more effective approaches to support the most vulnerable people in our communities. The experience of the bedroom tax has shown us the risks of Westminster taking the decisions for the whole of the UK on a one-size-fits-all one basis, ignoring the realities of circumstances here in Scotland. The proposal to vary the housing element of universal credit will enable us to prevent that happening in the future. Subject to this Parliament's ability to find the required resources, we now also have the prospect of being able to create new benefits which could assist our people. The long overdue agreement to transfer to this Parliament responsibilities and revenues of the Crown Estate to 200 nautical miles is a proposal that has had long-standing support across the parties. With these powers, we will be able to ensure island and coastal communities receive 100% of the net income from seabed leasing revenues, ensure there is a coherent system of support for our renewables industry, and enable greater investment in a wide variety of projects, ranging from harbour improvements to community tourism projects. The Islands Minister is beginning discussions on the use of these powers in Orkney today. Finally, and I'm sure everyone in this chamber will welcome the fact that this Parliament will have control over our own elections. This Parliament has more than demonstrated its competence in delivering fair and robust constitutional processes. I am particularly pleased that we secured agreement on the need for early action to allow us to extend the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds for the 2016 election. Following, 
Following the publication of the report, the Government wants to make rapid progress in implementing these recommendations in full and in, tr in, in true to the spirit and the intention of the Smith report. To make that progress successfully, there are a number of principles that should be observed. Firstly, we believe the UK and Scottish Governments must work jointly in producing the draft clauses due to be published by the end of January. The First Minister wrote to the Prime Minister on the day the report was published to offer the Scottish Government's full participation. And the point about this is that we have just had an experience in the Smith Commission where a Joint Secretariat representing or composed of members of the civil service of the United Kingdom Government, of the Scottish Government and also parliamentary staff from this institution have been able to effectively and properly support the Commission. It would seem logical to extend that approach to include also the drafting of the relevant clauses to put into practice the commitments of the Smith Commission. The second principle is that where possible both governments should take early action on devolution and on tackling key areas of concern. The most pressing is early action to secure the powers for this Parliament to enfranchise 16 and 17 year olds as this Government would like to do and is supported across the political spectrum in this Parliament in time for the 2016 election. All of us have watched the tremendous success of the extension of the franchise to 16 and 17 year olds during the referendum, which was a model of democratic participation and democratic engagement. And it is essential that the commitments that were made to 16 and 17 year olds in the referendum are extended to ensure their participation in the elections to this parliament in 2016. The First Minister repeated the Commission's call for early action in, on the issue of 16 and 17 year old representation in her letter to the Prime Minister last week. And I'm sure this whole Parliament is hopeful of a positive response to that proposition. Similarly, early legislative action could be taken to devolve air passenger duty. The 2012 Scotland Act provides an order making power to add new devolved taxes to the land and buildings transaction tax and the landfill tax, which we are now currently implementing. Early action could also be taken on gender quotas. In her previous ministerial role, Shona Robertson wrote to the UK Government outlining the Scottish Government's proposals for a Section 30 order to provide this Parliament with the necessary competence. We must make progress down that route. Paragraph 96 of the Smith Commission report lists a number of important issues for consideration that do not require an act of devolution. These include important issues around immigration to support our economy, asylum seekers, victims of human trafficking, retention of fine income in Scotland, and also in relation to health and safety. My Cabinet colleagues and I will be writing to our UK counterparts seeking early discussions on these matters over the next few days. Progress on these powers would be an early down payment on the further devolution we have all been promised and will be a key test of the UK Government's commitment. My third principle is that the UK and Scottish Government should start preparing in good faith for the transfer of the powers identified in Lord Smith's report. In particular, the United Kingdom Government should, take, should not take any steps or decisions that would significantly affect the position of this Parliament after devolution or constrain our freedom to come to our own decisions without our express agreement. The most obvious example of this is the move from disability living allowance to personal independence payments that the First Minister mentioned in this chamber last week. The First Minister will be writing to the Prime Minister asking that the rollout of personal independence payments should be halted in Scotland and that the proposed cuts to disability benefits are not implemented before the responsibility is passed to this Parliament. I hope all members in this chamber will support that position. <laughs> Another example are the employment programmes such as the work programme. The current contracts for these are approaching their end. It is crucial that the UK and Scottish governments agree the arrangements that will follow these contracts and we should explore all the options including the devolution of responsibility to this Parliament as soon as is practical. Of particular importance is agreement that more powers are accompanied by firm financial foundations and a fiscal framework that provides an equitable settlement to both governments. Experience of the ongoing negotiation and implementation around the Scotland Act 2012, which I discussed at length with the Finance Committee yesterday in their evidence hearing session in, on the Isle of Arran, has shown the implementation of financial agreements is almost as important 
as the legislation itself. In my letter to the Chancellor on the autumn statement, I therefore propose that we meet in short order to start discussions on how these aspects of Lord Smith's recommendations will be implemented. There is a long way to go before the Smith recommendations are delivered for Scotland, but I believe we will have the best chance of fulfilling its commitments if we follow these principles. Joint working between the UK and Scottish governments, early actions where possible, and both governments preparing in good faith for the transfer to take place. This is not a process that can or should be confined to governments. Participation was one of the themes of the First Minister's comments on our programme for government last week, and participation and engagement have been watchwords for Scottish politics since the extraordinary experience of the referendum. At the start of the Smith process, we engaged with groups of stakeholders to shape our proposals for more powers and our approach to the Commission's work. The STUC supported devolution of employment law, health and safety, trade union law and the minimum wage. The STUC also advanced amendments to immigration legislation so that the Scottish Government would be able to direct immigration policy as it affects Scotland. The Institute of Directors suggested variable capital allowances to promote localised investment, particularly into businesses in challenged areas. And the Scottish Council for Development and Industry called for R&D incentives to improve Scotland's poor industrial record in this area. Children First supported powers over all aspects of employment rights and conditions to create a much more family-friendly employment regime. They also supported devolution of child support. The Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations supported devolving the full package of powers over welfare to create a welfare system that puts fairness and supporting people at its heart and the full devolution of equality law. The full devolution of equalities legislation was supported by Engender and other equalities groups. It should therefore be of little surprise that given that none of these responsibilities were devolved, there was such widespread disappointment on the publication of the report last week. The proposals, the proposals, mean, the proposals mean that control over 71% of taxes in Scotland remains at Westminster, along with 85% of welfare decisions, including the conditions and the sanctions that are causing so much distress in our country. These proposals cannot be characterised as home rule or as near federalism as is possible in the United Kingdom. The vow has quite simply not been fulfilled. Whilst Order. 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 Whilst the Commission may not have given us all the tools we want and for which we will continue to argue, we in the Scottish Government stand ready to play our part and we now look forward to the next steps in Scotland's journey. Thank you. Deputy First Minister will now take questions on the issues raised in his statement and tend to allow, allow around 30 minutes uh, for questions, after which we move on to next business. Members who wish to ask a question of the Deputy First Minister should press the request to speak button now. And I call Ian Gray. Thank you, President Officer. And I want to start by echoing the Deputy First Minister's comments about the good-natured approach to the Commission taken by all members, including the Deputy First Minister himself. What a pity, then, about the grudging nature of his statement. 500 words, 500 words on powers in the Smith Agreement and 2,000 on process, pitfalls, powers not there and transitional demands for down payments. What a depressing lack of imagination. With the, with the Smith Agreement, we will, if we choose, reintroduce a 50p tax rate for top earners, a 10p rate to help low earners. The Deputy First Minister could even extend the personal allowance the way he wants through a zero rate. We can re redesign the whole work programme to get people into work more effectively, redeploy hundreds of millions of pounds worth of disability benefits to re-inject dignity and respect into the system. We can attack child poverty by supplementing child benefit for families under, under uh, stress. We can reform carers' allowance to give carers the rights they want. And we can finally match attendance allowance and DLA to our own system of care of the elderly. We can construct 
a whole new Scottish welfare system of new benefits of our own design. We can, we can give coastal communities the benefits from their own shore and seabed. We can use extended borrowing powers to build the tens of thousands of houses we need. We can decide for ourselves about fracking. We can gender balance the boards of public bodies at our own hand, give 16 and 17 year olds the vote, and we can bring ScotRail back into the public sector. A parliament, a parliament entrenched, more extensive powers devolved than in federal Germany or federal Australia. <laughs> Presiding officer, this is the vow delivered. Scotland knows it. The Deputy First Minister was part of it. Why will he not just admit it? Deputy First Minister. Ian Gray uh, sat round the Smith Commission table as I did and he would have witnessed the willingness of the Scottish Government and the representatives of the Scottish National Party to advance the interests and the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Um, it is a matter of record because all of the proposals that we set out as a Government were set out in our submission to the Smith Commission of the 10th of October on a whole range of different issues, whether it's about um, economic responsibilities, whether it's about control over the welfare system, whether it's about ensuring that Scotland has the, uh, the economic levers at our disposal to generate the revenues that will allow us to create a fair society. All of that is a matter of public record. So Ian Gray's rather hysterical tone this morning is an indication of how desperate he is to try to tell the people of Scotland that somehow this is the sum total of the Labour Party's uh, proposals. Uh, Ian Gray has to wrestle with the fact that the Scottish Trade Union Congress is at odds with him about many aspects of the Smith Agreement, that the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations are underwhelmed by the lack of control over welfare. It is not a surprise that I should point these things out. After all, we as a government talk to these organisations, we listen to these organisations and we put forward their arguments in the Smith Commission as effectively as we possibly can do. And when Ian Gray talks about the, uh, the powers that are contained in the Smith Commission, about the ability to create new welfare benefits or to enhance existing welfare benefits, these powers are part of the Smith Commission. But this Parliament has to be able to generate the revenues that will enable us to pay for these things. And that's where Ian Gray has never been terribly good at working out how you generate the revenues and how you pay for things that you want to take forward. And at the heart of our proposition was the need for this Parliament to have transformative economic powers that would enable us to create the wealth to invest in a fair and civilised society in our country. And for Ian Gray to take comfort from the fact that he is, the Smith Commission delivers all these things that he talked about, yet in the welfare system, the punitive sanctions at the heart of the DWP regime in Scotland remain reserved to the United Kingdom is a travesty of the position that he can put forward. And on the question of depressing lack of, of ambition, the Labour Party personifies it. <laughs> Annabelle Goldie. Thank you, um, <coughs> Presiding Officer. Can I also echo what the Deputy First Minister and Ian Gray have already said about the process? And I would like to use this opportunity to place on record in this Parliament my thanks to Lord Smith and to the Secretariat from both governments. There cannot be a shadow of a doubt that in the complex and difficult discussions which we had to have, the quality of the data made available to us was second to none. And can I say, presiding officer, as a participant, the process was challenging, it was stimulating, it was certainly robust and at times fiery, but it was enjoyable. And that was in no small measure due to the sage, the patient and the shrewd chairmanship of Lord Smith. Now, of course, presiding officer, I accept that uh, what is unwelcome to these benches is that the Smith Agreement was always going to be about devolution. It was never going to be about independence. 
And I guess the reaction from these benches is predictable. I suppose the Smith Agreement could have delivered a crown for the First Minister, Scottish passports and heaven knows what else, and they still wouldn't be satisfied. It wouldn't be enough. I have to say, I thought the First Minister's reaction to what is a sweeping transfer of new powers to this Parliament was, and it's not a word I would use about her readily, but I thought her reaction was verging on the nebby. And I thought that the de Deputy First Minister was, if I may say so uncharacteristically, acidic, as though something very sour had passed his lips. Of course, I think what passed his lips was the recognition that this is a powerful, effective, implementable package of devolved measures for this Parliament. <laughs> And this agreement is a constitutional development of huge significance because with the exception of the SNP, by common assent, presiding officer, the proposed changes are more wide-ranging and powerful than I think was expected. Scotland, Scotland will now raise over 60% of what she spends. She will be amongst the most powerful sub-legislators in the world. And I think the SNP reaction to all of this confirms the reality. I think the SNP knows that the Smith Agreement shot their fox. <laughs> now, Order. dealing with the powers, the actual powers, not with the dreams and the aspirations of another party's constitutional future, can I ask the Deputy First Minister two short questions? The First Minister has expressed her enthusiasm for a 50p tax rate. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister, <coughs> is that a floor or a ceiling? And secondly, the Smith Agreement identified a specific issue in relation to this Parliament, its ability to hold the Scottish Government to account. And that becomes more pressing with the prospect of such a wide-ranging transfer of further powers to this Parliament. So can I ask the Deputy First Minister, is he in principle hostile to the proposal that some key committees should be chaired by opposition MSPs? Deputy First Minister. Let me deal first of all with Annabel Goldie's um, point that, um, the, that somehow the SNP has been alone in its disappointment at the conclusions of the Smith Commission. Graeme Smith, General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Union Congress, we are underwhelmed by the package as a whole which does not meet our aspirations. John Downey, Scottish Council of Voluntary Organisations. We are disappointed to see that today's offerings fall far short of this, which is the whole-scale devolution of welfare. One parent families disappointed about the outcome of the process. The Institute for Economic Affairs, the Smith proposals are a dangerous halfway house, failing to bring about the benefits that much fuller devolution would have brought to Scotland. In Gender Scotland, um, the, uh, this is a complicated division of responsibility we are concerned about how well the cumulative impact on women of this devolution has been assessed. Bill Scott of Inclusion Scotland, we are disappointed that the Smith Commission failed to devolve all welfare and more fiscal powers to Scotland. I am interested in listening to what the people of Scotland have said, and the people of Scotland are disappointed by the conclusions of the Smith Commission. The, on the two specific points that Annabel Goldie raised with me, um, first of all, on the issue of the 50 pence tax rate, the First Minister set out the Government's uh, position on the 50 pence tax rate if we had those powers today. Uh, and obviously, the, we, have no, uh, we have no sense of when the, um, the tax powers will be available to the Scottish Government for us to take decisions on that question. On the second question about um, chairing of parliamentary committees, it is um, perhaps territory that I venture into very carefully uh, since it is about parliamentary governance. Uh, but I have always believed, and I believe this about many aspects of local authority business, um, that it is absurd for um, uh, government members, for example, to chair an audit committee. I think that is absolutely ludicrous, because an audit committee should hold a government to account and should be chaired by an opposition member. That does not always happen in local authorities. I think it is ridiculous that that is not the case. So, yes, there are certain committees that should be chaired by opposition members. I have never made a secret of that part uh, in, in my belief in parliamentary democracy. Lord Campbell, followed by Willow Rennie. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the Deputy First Minister will be aware of press reports that the Chancellor is about to devolve corporation tax to Northern Ireland. Does he agree, quote, that if a scheme to vary corporation tax were to be available in some of the devolved countries of the UK as a tool of the UK Government's regional economic policy, it should be available as an option for a Scottish Government to use also? Any discussions about this should also involve all the devolved nations. And I quote from paragraph 59 of the Pros Party Group on the Scotland Bill in the last session of Parliament, chaired by Wendy Alexander. John Swinney. Uh, yes, I agree with that proposition, and I agreed with the recommendation that was brought forward by the, uh, the committee chaired by Wendy Alexander in the last Parliament, because I thought it was a fair reflection of the, uh, of, of the way in which this issue had to be handled uh, within the United Kingdom. And, uh, if we await the outcome of the autumn statement tomorrow, um, but if that is the proposition that emerges from the Chancellor's statement, then that is a proposition the Scottish Government will continue to take forward. Will Rennie, followed by Drew Smith. Uh, can I thank the Deputy First Minister for advance notice of his statement? However, it was all too predictable. For the first time ever, all five parties were in the one room to agree our constitutional future here in Scotland. But it only took him five minutes to rubbish the report that he had just signed. Just like today, he started off well in his statement, going through all the new powers that are coming to the Scottish Parliament. But they ended with a ridiculous tone, claiming the vow had not been met. Ridiculous. All five parties, not just three unionists, on time and a much more substantial package than anybody previously had envisaged. Is this what it's going to be like? The government could embrace these new powers, these new radical powers for Scotland, or is he just going to forever rerun the referendum Absolutely. that he just lost? Deputy First Minister. The, the, I don't think, um, think Willie Rennie was at the National Museum of Scotland when uh, I spoke following Lord Smith uh, last Thursday morning. And in the second paragraph of my uh, comments to that gathering at the National Museum, uh, I said, we welcome the new powers that will come to Scotland. What bit of welcome does Mr Rennie not understand? I'm perfectly happy to, to, to welcome uh, the contents of the report, to welcome the new powers that will come to Scotland. Uh, Mr Rennie shouldn't be at all surprised that I believe that Scotland should exercise uh, a full range of economic and social responsibilities. After all, I have believed that all of my adult life, and I will continue to do so for the remainder of my adult life. And I was greatly cheered by paragraph 18 of the uh, report that was agreed by all five parties. Paragraph 18. It is agreed that nothing in this report prevents Scotland becoming an independent country in the future, should the people of Scotland so choose. I'm delighted that all five political parties in the Parliament accept that fundamental proposition. It's a very good one. Drew Smith, followed by Kevin Stewart. Uh, Lord Smith reminded Parliament's devolution committee this morning, uh, presiding officer, the Smith Agreement was signed up to by all the parties and was bought into line by line, uh, in his words. So I join others in welcoming the Smith Agreement, which delivers this place as one of the most powerful devolved legislators anywhere in the world. But Lord Smith has also highlighted that devolution cannot be just about powers um, to this place. So while Ian Gray uh, indicated we have a broad agreement on the issue of the island's agenda and the Crown Estates, but why did the Deputy First Minister to, uh, 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 omit to mention the crucial issue of double devolution, where uh, power is exercised in Scotland, including over um, the work programme in his statement? And what reassurance can he offer that, that the Scottish Government is committed to powers uh, for Scotland's people, as well as just for themselves? First Minister. The, 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 any powers that are exercised in this Parliament, whether by this Government or any other Government, are exercised with the democratic consent of the people of Scotland. It's another fundamental point that I would have thought Mr Smith might have worked out after three years' membership of this institution. The second point I'd make is that the Scottish Government has made uh, very clear uh, our desire, uh, uh, and we've also turned it into practice by the removal, for example, of £2 billion worth of ring fencing that we inherited from the previous government that to give local authorities um, much greater scope for discretion and for action in their areas of responsibility. We've also 
um, br bringing forward, uh, we'll take forward uh, further propositions on the Community Empowerment Bill, which is designed to enable communities to have greater control and greater influence over their lives um, within their localities. Uh, and as we consider the implementation and the rollout of the Smith Commission proposals, um, we uh, look forward to discussing with local authorities and with uh, the communities of Scotland how we can best devolve responsibilities to the localities of Scotland so, the, so policies can be exercised and taken forward uh, in an appropriate way to meet the needs and the aspirations of communities in Scotland. And that will include also the details of the work programme into the bargain, which is why it would be helpful if Mr Smith and his colleagues would support the Government's call for the early devolution of the work programme and certainly not for any forced extension of the work programme by the United Kingdom Government. Kevin Stewart, followed by Sarah Boyack. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, the Deputy First Minister will be aware of reports that the draft version of the Smith Commission document was more radical, but that key recommendations on welfare appear to have been removed on the day that the UK Cabinet was briefed on the Smith, Smith Commission, according to the BBC on the 28th of November 2014. Does the Deputy First Minister share my concerns that these reports suggest that behind closed doors, around the Cabinet table, Tories with no mandate in Scotland are reported to have taken key welfare decision-making powers for Scotland off the table? Deputy First Minister. Uh, the, the Lord Smith said to the, uh, to the, uh, the, the, the Devolution Powers Committee in Parliament this morning, that he was um, conscious of the fact that um, uh, some party representatives were taking guidance from their superiors. Uh, I'm not sure that's quite the way I would describe it, but I suspect that answers Mr Stewart's question. Sarah Boyle, followed by Patrick Harvey. In relation to fracking and unconventional gas extraction, now that the Scottish Government will have licensing and planning powers, will the Scottish Government commit to my call for no approvals to be granted unless and until we have a clear policy on the climate implications of this new source of gas for Scotland, that regulatory and licensing loopholes have been closed, that both our regulators and planners have the vital knowledge and skills to address the risks of new extraction techniques, and will the Deputy First Minister agree to supply targeted finance to those local authorities on the front line, as they did with renewables in 2012? Deputy First Minister. The, uh, on the, 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 the number of issues that Sarah Boyack raised there about the handling of uh, any questions in this area of responsibility. I would want to assure Sarah Boyack that the type of questions that she has raised are all absolutely legitimate issues to be in the contents of any policy approach to be taken in this respect. So all of the points that Sarah Boyack raises um, are issues that have to be considered. They are why this government has taken an evidence-based approach, and that includes ensuring that there are satisfactory answers to the points that Sarah Boyack has raised. On our final point about resources to planning authorities, uh, we will give consideration to that point. Um, it, it is important, if the first part of my answer is to be delivered by local authorities, that these issues are properly and fully scrutinised by the relevant uh, authorities, whether they are regulatory authorities or, or, or local authorities. And we will certainly consider the issue that has been raised by Sarah Boyack. Patrick Harvey, followed by Christina McKelvey. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the Deputy First Minister for his statement. Uh, to a large extent, the impact of the recommendations that are included in the, in the Smith report will depend not on the paragraphs on these pages, but on the way in which they're implemented, the legislation and the policy and operational changes that flow from that. Does the Deputy First Minister agree that the impact of the detailed implementation is going to have to be one where agreement is sought between the two governments, not least on major issues like the way the borrowing regime is expected to work. And does he have any clear indication from the UK government yet that they're prepared to work with him ahead of the drafting of legislation by the end of January? First Minister. The, 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 the point that Mr Harvey makes is absolutely fundamental to this discussion. As we saw with the Calman recommendations and the command paper that was published by the United Kingdom Government, um, we had to press very hard to secure reforms 
to the, pro the proposals for the implementation of the Calman recommendations because in their original form they would have been financially disadvantageous to the Scottish Parliament and to the Scottish Government. So, Mr Harvey is absolutely correct. The translation of the words of the Smith Commission into draft clauses and to particular points of legislation is crucial um, in ensuring that this is translated in, in, in a fashion that meets the needs and the expectations of people within Scotland. I think that is best delivered in an open and transparent fashion where we have joint authorship of the clauses, where many of the issues which are relevant uh, on both sides of the debate are properly considered uh, within that space and Parliament is able to consider the output of a joint process, which is what the Scottish Government has recommended and what the First Minister has raised with the Prime Minister. Uh, to date, I have not seen any response to that particular proposal, uh, but I do hope it is... Uh, if we are to be serious, as the Smith Commission report is serious about, as Mr Harvey well knows, to strengthen the whole process of intergovernmental discussion um, between the Scottish and United Kingdom governments, I think that would be a sensible and practical way to proceed forward. Christina McKelvey, followed by Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, President Officer. Does the Deputy First Minister share my disappointment that there was no recommendation in the Smith Commission report that would allow Scotland to force our own minimum wage, something which a number of organisations across the country call for, including Children First, the Child Poverty Action Group and the STUC? And can the Deputy First Minister also provide assurances that he will continue to press for powers over minimum wage to be devolved to Scotland and that Westminster, especially the unelected House of Lords, does not attempt to roll back on what has been agreed in the Smith Commission? Yeah. I, I, I do share the, the disappointment that powers over the minimum wage have not been devolved to Scotland. I think they would have assisted us in tackling some of the very serious issues of in-work poverty that we wrestle with within Scotland today and give us some practical tools to enable us to do that. On the question of um, implementation, I can assure uh, Christina McKelvey that the Scottish Government will work assiduously, and I, I, I set this out as clearly as I possibly could in my statement, to ensure the satisfactory implementation of the Smith Commission recommendations, and that will be at the heart of the approach taken forward by the Scottish Government. Jack Bailey, followed by Jamidi. Presiding officers, the spice briefing on fiscal devolution shows this can be a real powerhouse parliament. The Smith Agreement was, by any reasonable reckoning, a substantial transfer of power. Disability living allowance, personal independence payment, attendance allowance, carers allowance, motability allowance, the list goes on and on and on. This is a set of serious powers. But perhaps the most radical and potentially substantial of all, the ability to create our own benefits. Can I, on that basis, ask the Deputy First Minister whether he will set up a cross-party mechanism to consider how to implement these new powers to benefit some of the most vulnerable people in our communities. The, the, the Scottish Government is always keen to work collaboratively across the political spectrum on issues of joint interest, and this is of course one of them. Um, we, in the spirit of trying to advance the implementation of the agreement, uh, we have to ensure that the manner and the form of its implementation is uh, appropriate for Scotland's needs and circumstances. That is why I answered Patrick Harvey in the way that I just answered him on a joint approach to the drafting of the clauses between the Scottish and the United Kingdom governments. Um, and that is our first priority to ensure that we actually secure the translation of the Smith Commission recommendations into practical and useful powers for the Parliament, because I'm sure Jackie Bailey will understand um, my concern that uh, the, 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 the powers could be interpreted, they could be defined in a more restrictive way than perhaps the Smith Commission uh, viewed them to be the case, and we will want to ensure that they are implemented uh, to the full. But certainly on the issue of um, wider dialogue and cooperation around what we may do on welfare issues, I'm sure that's the the type of area where we can have joint work within the Parliament. Jimmy Dick, followed by Joe McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister what the Scottish Government's response will now be to the failure to include in the Heads of Agreement the view of NUS Scotland 
Universities Scotland, Scottish Chambers of Commerce, the Institute of Directors Scotland, the Scottish Council for Development and Industry and Unison Scotland uh, view that there should be partial devolution of immigration to enable the reintroduction of a two-year post-study work visa for international students graduating from Scottish universities, as this would have done much to maximise our human capital and promote economic growth in the key industrial sectors of the future, such as life sciences and renewable energy. First Minister. The point that Mr Eady makes is a very serious point, which has been well made by the range of organisations to which, but the range of organisations to which he referred, um, including University of Scotland and the National Union of Students. And it is a very common theme in my discussions with universities uh, that are raised with me about the limitations that the current regime applies um, in terms of the ability to recruit students and personnel as a consequence. A number of issues were um, left uh, requiring further development as a consequence of the Smith Commission. Um, I raised a number of them in my uh, earlier statement, uh, and I can assure uh, the, the paragraph 96 of the agreement makes particular reference to these uh, points um, where the, the, the parties raised a number of additional policy matters which could be taken forward by joint work between the Scottish and the United Kingdom governments. I can assure Mr Eady that that is exactly what the Scottish Government will do on this important question, and we will aim to make as much progress as we possibly can do to effect the implementation of um, some form of mechanism to ensure that we can attract the talent that Scotland requires at this time. Joe McAlpine, followed by Jenny Mara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Commission proposes devolving income tax on an allocation of some VAT, but vows to keep the Barnet formula in place. Can the Government tell us how the Barnet allocation will be calculated, and in particular, if future Scottish Governments are successful in stimulating the economy and gain additional revenue from these taxes, will those Scottish Governments, and by extension the Scottish people, be able to keep this additional revenue hence ensuring a link between government policy and financial reward? And can the Deputy First Minister confirm whether an agreement has been reached with the UK Government on what impact the Scotland Act 2012 taxes will have on the Scottish Block Grant? First Minister. On the last point that Joe McAlpine makes, and this was the substance of my conversation with the Finance Committee and Aaron yesterday, um, it remains an outstanding issue that we have not secured agreement with the United Kingdom Government on the block grant adjustment for the land and buildings transaction tax and the landfill tax. And that was something that I was keen to secure agreement upon before I set out the budget to Parliament on the 9th of October. I was unfortunately unable to get that agreement and only on Friday I received um, some communication from the Chief Secretary to the Treasury um, setting out some further proposals in this respect which, to which I am currently giving consideration. Um, so these issues that were raised in 2012 still remain outstanding and need to be resolved. In relation to the wider questions raised by the Smith Commission, um, the Barnett formula will continue to apply, but there will be a block grant adjustment that will take into account the transfer of greater responsibility over um, income tax powers. Um, uh, the, uh, as Lord Smith confirmed to the Parliamentary Committee this morning, um, if the Scottish Government is successful in uh, delivering higher tax receipts on income tax, for example, um, beyond the block grant adjustment, then those receipts can be retained by the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Government for use in relation to uh, our wider responsibilities. And um, it is essential, um, as we have always argued, that if the Scottish Parliament is to be successful in the implementation of any of its policy agenda, it has to be able to bear the rewards uh, of all of that, uh, because on the other side of the coin, we will be carrying the risks of exercising those responsibilities into the bargain. Jenny Mara, followed by Stuart McMillan. Presiding officer, figures from the International Labour Organisation show unemployment in Dundee at nearly 14 per cent, double the general rate. And Dundee has, become, has come bottom of tables on the success of the UK work programme. I'm sure the Deputy First Minister will agree with me that we need more than powers to get the long-term unemployed in Scotland into work. The Deputy First Minister says he wants the work programme devolved quickly. So what ideas does he have to make the work programme work better in Scotland? Deputy First Minister. 
Well, first of all, um, I think that many of the actions the, government, the Scottish Government is taking uh, to support investment in Dundee, and every time I travel through the city of Dundee, which I do frequently, I see the fruits of the Scottish Government's extensive investment programme, uh, particularly around the waterfront area, which is a, a remarkable piece of strategic investment, um, which is... Um, I hear, there's, I, I hear there's usual unanimity in the Labour benches about where the money's been spent. Um, uh, more, than likely, more than likely, the Labour Party will be wanting to spend the money twice. It's a, it's a familiar refrain. Um, on the question that uh, Jenny Mara raised about the work programme, what I would want to see is the resources. I basically think the UK work programme has been a failure. I don't think it's delivered results in any respect. If I was presiding over that programme, I'd be horrified at its poor performance. So the resource is an expensive programme, and it should be the resources that are applied, that are de deployed there, should be used to support the type of um, employability schemes that are now commonplace, taken forward as partnerships between third sector organisations in Scotland, local authorities around the country, where we tailor them to the needs and the needs of people who have been long term unemployed in the city of Dundee, will be different to the needs of people who have faced. Um, who have been out of the labour market for a shorter period of time than in other parts of the country, but they are no less valid uh, than uh, in other parts of the country. So we need to tailor our response to meet the particular needs and circumstances and localities in the country, and we can best do that in consort with the third sector and local authority employability schemes that we have in Scotland. Today, the work programme operates in a fashion that's not consistent with, those, with that regime. So that's how I would take it forward. Um, I would caution um, the consideration at this point to consider the fact that we will still face the, uh, the, the interaction with the sanctions regime of the United Kingdom benefits regime, which is a severe limitation on some of the issues which I think need to be considered in trying to support people out of economic inactivity and into employment. Stuart McMillan, followed by Alex Rowley. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, does, the current, does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that, uh, that a Westminster Government retaining control of around 70 per cent of tax raising powers and around 85 per cent of welfare powers falls far short of the promises of home rule and maximum devolution when compared to the levels of autonomy afforded elsewhere, uh, particularly in the likes of Switzerland, Canada, or the Basque Country and Navarra? Uh, clearly, uh, Mr McMillan will appreciate that I would have liked the Smith Commission to come up with a broader range of responsibilities to enable the Scottish Government to exercise um, greater control um, through Parliament of the lives of people within Scotland and to create the opportunities, uh, particularly the economic opportunities that are so vital to the uh, prosperity of Scotland. Um, it's, you, we, we, the Smith Commission had in front of it, from both political parties and from wider Scotland, a range of proposals that would enable that to have been the case, and I regret the fact that we did not manage to secure agreement on those points. Kenneth Gibson, followed by Alex Rowley. The Deputy First Minister will be aware that there have been different interpretations of what the Smith Commission proposal would mean for tax and expenditure levels here in Scotland. Can I therefore provide clarity today on the proportion of taxes raised in Scotland and expenditure that the Scottish Parliament would have power over if the Smith Commission proposals are fully implemented? Cabinet uh, Secretary. Presiding Officer, uh, under the Smith Commission proposals, devolved taxes as a percentage of total uh, Scottish tax revenues will be 29% and devolved and assigned taxes as a percentage of the devolved expenditure, as it would be post-Smith, would be 48%. I'm afraid I took you out of order, Mr Rowley, but you do get the last word. Alex Rowley. Thank you very much, President Officer. Um, now that the Scottish Government, the Scottish Parliament, will have more powers over spending than most federal or devolved regimes across the world, Will this government move beyond talking about inequality to a radical agenda for social and economic change, which puts the eradication of poverty within a generation at the heart of all government policy and action? Will the government move beyond the politics of grievance and embrace the politics of change? Deputy First Minister. Um, what I'd say to Mr Rowley is that um, many of the important uh, powers that would enable us to tackle uh, uh, the issues of inequality and to eradicate poverty 
will remain after the Smith Commission reserved to the United Kingdom Government. The sanctions around welfare will remain the exclusive preserve of the United Kingdom Government. It is one of the key powers and responsibilities in our ability to tackle inequality. Um, I have just uh, recounted to Parliament that 85 per cent of control of welfare spending will remain reserved to the United Kingdom Government. So, I'm, uh, Mr Rowley knows me well enough to know that I will use the powers available to the Scottish Parliament to deliver as much opportunity, to tackle as much inequality as I possibly can do. But we have to be straight with the people of Scotland that the Smith Commission means that significant areas of responsibility remain reserved to the United Kingdom Government, and that is a matter of regret from the Smith Commission's yeah, position. Yeah. That ends a statement from the Deputy First Minister on the Smith Commission. We move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11756 in the name of Fergus Ewing on tourism.